One of the questions that I had, what are your main concerns about um, implementing Common Core in your classroom? And, I, and yesterday, the secondary people had some concerns, but I have a feeling those concerns might be a little different from the elementary concerns. So if you would mind, instead of writing on a large sheet, we have plenty of whiteboard space, so if you would just go up there and write at least one question from your group. Because I have a feeling we might have, if we had two from each group, we'd have quite a bit of overlap. We need to all and maybe, um, yeah, how about, uh, that's it. Oh, okay. how about, um, they take everyone. You could have gone on forever. Assessments, you know, in terms of, do you feel that you guys have the assessments that, that, um, match what you are, you know, the, the common core standards? Uh, it's okay to sit down. It's okay to sit down. Well, like, yeah, because you're the upper group, so I think that you're a whole yeah. time to be Chat mark time over there, district requirements and curriculum, uh, resources in Spanish, Patricia, um, and assessments, transdisciplinary assessments. And this will probably be the last thing that's created, although it should be kind of the first and guide us in what we do, but it's always the last. And um, but as far as the time goes, I think some of the strategies we're going to cover today and some of the different things and the idea that the whole reading has to be shifted, the focus from um, information with more informational texts um, rather than what that the studies have come out just last week. There was a study about children's literature and looking at reading programs and readers and stuff like that. In the 1980s, with A Nation at Risk, in 83, they were talking about how bad we were in science. We have gotten no better in the recent study. They looked at everything from that time until now. We have spent billions of dollars on materials and have, have had zero gains. And what we saw was an increase in the amount of the average amount of time spent on science increased during the 90s, and we've already decreased back to our levels in the 80s. So it's a little bit bothersome that we spent so much time and energy and everything was stem this and stem that, and yet we got nothing from that, no real gains. So um, I'm going to show you guys a bunch of um, award-winning trade books that can be used in the classroom and I'm the queen of buying the used books on Amazon. So a lot of these books you'll pay more for shipping than you will for the book itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 
a lot of them I pay $2.99 for a book and pay for the shipping. And then when I go on one of these buying binges, my husband's like, what are you buying? Because he's going to the door every day and pulling in all the packages that come from every bookseller across the country. And But that's fine with me because I'm like, I don't mind spending the money, my own money, on these supplies because I want everybody to see what's out there and the great stuff that's out there because the teachers have to teach 50% informational texts in the way that the Common Core has been shifted in the focus of your um, the texts that are used pre-K to 5. Now that's interesting. Pre-K has to do 50% informational texts just like 5th grade. So it's, it's, it's kind of fun to actually look at the change and see how that's, how that's shifted. Um, we're also going to go over the amount of time spent on various type of writing. And I realize that pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, they're just learning their letters and, and getting their fine motor skills going. But at the um, middle elementary, upper elementary, there's no reason why we can't start writing the various types of um, text like argumentation is one part that you've got to cover and it actually gives a percentage of the writing that has to be each type and they break it down into five types of writing so uh, we will go over that um, I've also got a book list that I've been searching for um, somehow I managed to lose my copy of my book list and I have three years to go back and work on tomorrow but that and that's okay because I want to add because I'll add the NGSS and all that stuff for the 2013 and 14 winners um, and I think I'm gonna add some of the um, other winners too and so I'll beef my list up a little bit and I might just put a separate tab on the bottom for the YALSA winners and uh, the CBER and stuff like that that deal with science. So, um, and I told Patricia I would add a check mark list for books that have availability in Spanish. So, you would also have that. So, you could order both an English and a Spanish copy. All right, so if you look at the center part, that's where the math, the language arts, and the science all converge. Building a strong knowledge base through content-rich text is one of the, um, the main foci of our changes in instruction. Uh, reading, writing, speaking grounded in evidence. A lot of kids these days, it's all opinion. They don't back anything up in evidence. So we have to kind of move back to the evidence part. I don't care how you feel. Just give me the evidence. Thank you. Um, construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. The critiquing the reasoning of others can happen in the elementary grades, but it's a little bit more difficult and is something that um, is more comfortable if you start in grades like four, five, and do it some, but not a whole lot. And then grade six, really give them the tools to be able to critique each other. And we're going to do an activity in a few minutes that actually can be used as a groundbreaker type of a thing in your classroom, icebreaker. And then you can move forward and um, incorporate the activity more and use different, um, different statements that the kids would look at. And then engage an argument from evidence. When there's that evidence again. Um, so, the informational texts are extremely important here. And then you can look at all the other colors that are there for the links between science and ELA and math and ELA and just the science, math, and ELA separately. And the, uh, there's another page right here. This is all from the NGSS at NSTA uh, website. And, um, this just listed the main areas that are on the chart. All right, so let's look at what our links to language arts and math are. Language arts has seven different areas. Reading literature, so reading fiction, um, 
and generally the, the readers in the earlier grades. Then it's informational text, so 50%, 50%. Literacy in science and technical subjects. All right, the literacy in science and technical subjects is, um, they, they actually break that down in the um, CCSS, language arts, um, and you can find the, um, you can find the, the section and read that on the literacy in the science and technical subjects, but the problem has been that kids have a hard time. Of course, informational texts are different from uh, fiction, just general literature. But the technical, technical writing and reading is completely different. So at some point, we have to expose the students to more of the technical writing. And you're not going to necessarily pull out a research article for them to read in elementary grades. That's not going to work. But there's no reason why you can't give instructions on how to put something together. So instead of you going home and building whatever it is, give the kids the instructions and let them practice putting things together, reading the instructions from a technical guide because that's very, it's a very different type of knowledge base. And um, you can have them put things together. We've got a, uh, we just linked yesterday, um, there's a coolest thing. I've got a um, microscope for an iPad, but they're $149. On a website that I found, you can actually build a microscope out of plexiglass, plywood, and uh, lag bolts. It's really simple. It works. And you can zoom based on the cap capacities of your phone. So um, all the kids, almost all the kids show up today in classrooms with smartphones. So you can easily build this little microscope for the use with a smartphone for $10. And it won't break when you carry it out to the field if you want to go and go outside and look at leaves, grass, bugs, anything at all. Carry it out to the field, just dump it down in a, um, in a bag and carry it with. Sit it down anywhere and use it. Oh, uh, we've, we've got it on the, um, it's, on, it's on your website. Yeah. So, um, that's a little bit about that. The writing and report findings grounded in evidence. So we've got to get kids writing lab reports at an earlier age because they can do it. We just have to give more parameters for writing those reports. So if we make them simple at the very beginning where they fill in certain parts, then they, you, you take away some of the structure and they have to write the parts. You know, so figure it out with your school when you want to implement certain things and then use that consistently and strategically throughout. Then you're guiding the kids toward being more independent. So when they get to ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, a lab report is not a strange thing to them. Um, constructing arguments and critiquing the reasoning of others. Um, I would say, like I said before, the earlier grades, not a really good idea. Um, because they're not, in the, in the really early grades, the K through two, they're not really writing expository types of pieces anyway. But when they start writing sentences and things like that, having to actually edit each other's sentences for grammar and for the use of punctuation and for the use of capital letters and non-capital letters or whatever you want to give them to actually use as parameters. Speaking and listening is a good part and um, that's, a, that's a huge part of what they're moving toward in the um, Common Core. So speaking, speaking and listening is, is is just that. So you want to actually give them the practice of actually listening to each other and what we're going to do as an activity in a few minutes actually combines five and six. So it's a good strategy that you can use kind of across the board and then using technology and digital media. So any time you can have the kids using an app of some sort 
That's great. Um, they're on their phones all the time. They know how to play games. Well, we can teach them to use apps that are educational in nature. Um, math, making sense of problems and persevering to solve them. Perseverance is the major issue in the schools today. The kids see a problem that they think they can't solve and they quit. In, in Asia, you can give students a problem that has no solvable answer. And they will keep at it for two hours until you stop them. And they'll still argue with you that they can find the answer. Um, so we have to give them the chance to actually, or we have to push them to actually try to solve problems even though they think it's unsolvable. And uh, reason abstractly and quantitatively, that's important. Um, that abstract reasoning, I don't see a lot of that even in college students at the undergraduate level. I don't know if they've been so trained in their train of thought that they just automatically kind of have blinders on and it's been, and they're, some of them are very concrete. Um, and making models using math, um, we have to make it comfortable for the kids to actually use the math in science because we know that we know as educators that you can't divorce science from math. It's all integrated. But I have a, I've had a lot of high school kids and college students saying, why am I doing math in this classroom? This is science. And they'll argue with you about doing math. And it's like, no, you don't get it. You have to solve that problem. That equation we, we've covered in class. So apply the equation to what you've been studying and then find your answer. I'm not giving you the answer. Find your best answer. And that comes down to using appropriate tools and measurement and data with precision. Part of the problem is that we don't give the kids the tools because they're not coming to school with the same tools we did. If you think about it, how many of you helped measure dry and wet quantities in the kitchen with your mom before you went to kindergarten. A large portion of us. All right, so we knew that there were two cups and a pint, right? And we knew that a quart was 32 ounces. And we knew the difference between dry and wet measure, right? These kids, a lot of them have never, you would think they had never walked through a kitchen before. But, it helps to actually have some of those tools and just use rice. If you don't want to make, make a huge mess, just use rice. It's pourable. The small grains, you don't have to worry about um, big gaps. And they can pour from one container to another and they can see that two cups of rice equals a pint. And you can buy all types of um, measurement cubes and different shapes and things, and you can just fill those with rice. And they can, um, they can easily see that one shape is equivalent to another shape in volume by pouring the rice from one to the other. It's, it's a really easy way to do that. And then that goes right toward um, using patterns and structure. And there are some books that are really, really good that have sort of a math tie-in, which have been released in the last couple of years. So I'll, I'll show those to you also. All right, and then let's look at the pedagogical shifts that uh, these things require. So ELA and literacy is balancing the informational and literary texts. Knowledge in the disciplines. Um, this one's tough because people in the elementary classrooms generally have had, and the way that the certification has been structured in the state, you generally have a major in a certain area. So there are gaps in knowledge for some of the other areas. And it's okay to, I, I try to train my um, pre-service teachers, and train is not really a good word, but it's, it's the way it is. But I trained them to say, I don't know, but let's find out. Because you cannot be the keeper of all knowledge. And if you let the kids be involved in that searching, 
they're doing research and the kids who might be the ones, the very ones who sit in the back of the class and never raise their hand can get involved. And they, that kid might be the one that finds the right answer. And then they can share and practice their listening and speaking skills by sharing the results with the whole class. Um, staircases of complexity, and what they're talking about is just going up the staircase of complexity and not jumping. So this requires, this requires everybody talking to everybody else because you can't expect kids just to jump from a very simple type of an activity to a very complex activity in, say, fifth grade when they don't have a background, say, in fourth grade to build them up to that point. So we have to conceptually look at everything. Elementary people have to start talking to middle school people. Middle school people have to start talking to high school people. Because we have, I think it, the number was 70% of our kids change districts and schools. So you don't have a really large number of people following through. Plus, in this room, there are a lot of magnet schools who are here. So how many schools do you guys have come into yours? As a, as a feeder, or how many do you feed to? We have uh, everything that's contiguous to our school district. It might be like 13 to 15 districts. Okay, 13 to 15 districts. So think about the number of schools within those districts. And then, Patricia, you're in uh, Wyndham, North Wyndham, which is just the North Wyndham area. Right. It's a dual language. It's a dual language school. Okay. And then you guys. We have six uh, outside districts and then okay. four to seven. Yeah. So that's pretty huge. And then... We have 44 different towns. Yeah, 44 towns. We had one yesterday with about 35 towns. And Crack is, well, we, is huge. Yeah, I mean, we have 35, our 35 member down, towns to the right. west, but then it also offshoots because it's been over right. to the entire state. You can get them there. You're, you're That's there. exactly right. If, if with school choice, if you can get your kid to the school, they can go there. So we have to we have to start thinking beyond our borders in our towns, and just affecting the few people who are the taxpayers in the town. We've got to think a little bit more globally now. <laughs> and what about you guys? Okay, about thirteen. That's pretty big. And then. Oh, the same. That's right. So, um, really, it's a it's a it's a mind-boggling type of thing when you really think about the whole idea of magnet schools because we have to make sure with the with the standards that we're using that everybody in first grade is covering the same thing in first grade, and it goes through the grades like that. So. Um, I know it's a it's a more prescriptive type of thing, but that's what Common Core is. It's a common curriculum. So if you think of that as being a little bit more of a common type of curriculum that everybody, um, now the states who have opted out of Common Core, you know it's hard to it's hard to judge, but at the same time, Connecticut has approved Common Core. We don't know where we sit with science standards at this point. So, we, but, but going with NGSS cannot hurt because it's a step above the science standards we had. And, and it's more depth, more in depth content. So we're no longer a mile wide and inch deep. We're going deeper into each topic area. Um, and it's still not a huge number of topics. We just have to decide where those grade bands break down as a state and which ones are going to be covered in grade three, four, five. You, you know, so we've, that has to be a decision that's made in the state. And so in math, it's about focus, coherence, fluency, deep understanding, application, and dual intensity. So it's... Um, it is about the focus and coherence. That's, that's a really important part. But the deep understanding, I think, is, is one of the most important pieces 
under the shift. Um, I know that some of the districts are using some math programs that um, are a little, try to be nice, a little convoluted because they have kids doing all these little things and filling in grids for numbers, for ones and tens and all that stuff. And it's like 61, that's six tens and one one. <coughs> it's not that difficult. We don't have to be making it so difficult for the kids. And the purpose behind that can be argued all day. But one of the purposes is kind of bubble to the surface is trying to separate the kids from their parents. And, and that's a, it's a conspiracy theory, but it bubbles up and you hear it and you read and you see the worksheets that are posted online for Common Core Math and you go, that's just stupid. My husband's a nuclear engineer and looked at some of the worksheets and said, what the heck is this? And I'm like, exactly. <coughs> So how would you explain to a, to a kid, a fourth grade kid, how to solve this problem? So I think in some cases we're actually going to move back to the basics because for a number of years now we've had kids come through the system who don't know multiplication tables. There's a trick to multiplication tables, but you have to actually learn certain ones prior to applying the tricks. And it's just, it's just, just learn it. It's, it's not that difficult. And there's a link between addition, subtraction, and multiplication and division. So if you can, <coughs> excuse me, if you can work, yeah, thank you. If you can work on those tricks and get the kids to see the links between addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, then you have it whipped. And every kid learns it. So balancing the um, big picture goals and details is the part for balancing the information on literary texts. So there is a, um, you've got a worksheet, I'm trying to think which it is. Oh, oh, thank you. The thinking maps. So if you'll take that out, it's just a one page handout with thinking maps at the top. Common language for the common core. Those of you who have been around for a while, these were the original, um, the original, they didn't call them thinking maps back then, they were just simply graphic organizers from the 1980s. And what they've done is they've applied the learning research to the graphic organizers and come up with the eight cognitive skills that are covered in these. So they've aligned these for you. And the nice thing about this page is actually um, the Common Core State Standards and Questions are written here, the thinking process, and the thinking map tool that would go with that process. So if you look at tree map, that would be classifying. And you can determine the main ideas or text and key supporting details in complex text. So if we, if we give the kids the tools so they can read the more complex text, we might have to tell them, okay, in this particular text, you are going to use, or in this part of this chapter, I can think of biological textbooks. So difficult to read because, no, because it's like a foreign language to most people. It's, you know, all these classifications and orders and systems and families and, oh, my gosh, I can't keep up. But for the classification, you can easily just say, all right, I want you to use a tree map as you read your homework tonight. Create a tree map. Patricia's laughing. Homework? No. Don't give it to the parents. <laughs> Don't give it to the parents to do? Well... It would be good if some of the parents could actually do a tree map. Um, you can do a double bubble for comparing and contrasting two different points. 
You can do a bubble map for describing something. So this doesn't only hold for science, it's for math, it's for um, social studies, because there's a lot in social studies, and I can tell you, I got through college, and I used to brag about the fact that I got through college without taking a single history class. Because I went to a research university, and it was not required. And I chose something out of that little list they give you for each of the categories. I chose my 12 credits that I could use in my major or that would be useful for me, and history was not one of those things. Now, later on in life, I appreciate history because if we don't understand history, we don't understand where we've come from, and we can't understand where we're going. And I wish politicians would pay attention to where we've been and where we're going. But anyway, um, they, they would be a lot smarter if they did. But we can, we can give our kids tools to be able to use the strategies for reading and it's just like what we had like I said during the 80s I saw some heads you know because that was that was when thinking maps were or, or your graphic organizers were really popular but now they're called thinking maps so all we have to do is change our title in our brains now as far as text genres go going to go over here to the dot camera. Um, text genres, so 50% literature, 50% um, informational expository. So this breaks it down into the various types. So fictional narratives and gives you the types, poetry, drama, narrative structures, expository. Now, I have to tell you that you are setting up the kids for a future where they're their reading of text is going to be broken down even in high school. Do you have the one for six? Yeah, the 612. What they're saying is um, there's a decreasing amount of literary text down to 35% by the time a kid is in 12th grade. So they start off 50-50 up through grade four and then go from six to 12, de slowly decreasing that amount from 50-50 to um, 50, 55, 70 for informational and 45, 30 or yeah, 45, 30 going along grades 8 and grades 12 in literary so you can see how you're decreasing by 15%, which is great, but our high school structures currently are mostly, almost all 100% this literature narrative and we're talking about reducing to 35 percent literary when they're seniors so what are they reading they should be consumers of nonfiction, and it should be more of an argumentative based class where they're actually looking up data to support their hypothesis about something and so we're talking even in the language arts classes here so that we're talking a huge shift here this is a really big shift Do you think and they'll end up using more textbooks for that informational text? but if you look at the textbooks that they've been using in those high high school type literature classes it's all literature narrative even in the textbook in, in their English classes. So the English classes are probably going to have one of the highest um, hurdles to jump over because if we're moving to a 35% or a 30% by 12th grade literary, we can easily add a little poetry or a little of um, these things into a science classroom, but then we're already covering this in spades in a physics class or a biology class or an environmental science class. So we really have, you guys have the best world where this split is concerned. High school has a lot further to go. And we just have to work on getting more of the nonfiction trade books that are really, really good and not those what I call hokey readers 
in the classroom that call themselves science, but they're not really science because they're just awful. You read them and you go, so what? You could do, uh, you could even show videos within a classroom and then have the students figure out what type of, um, what type of thinking map tool they would use and they, they could even write down what the cause and effect would be. So one of the things could be cause effect where you use like a multi-flow map but that might not be the best one to use. So let's watch the one minute video and then you can, because um, you could actually use something like this as a post assessment. So when you've been talking about air pressure and um, things like that, then you, can, you could actually say, I want you to watch this one minute video, create a uh, text tool, um, a thinking map, that fits and, um, and you can even give them the uh, thinking map sheet and they could, um, they could actually write their reasoning for why whatever happened. So you could actually have the kids watch the video, do the post assessment using the thinking map, and you would learn more about what they knew from that thinking map than you're going to find out from a true false type of quiz or whatever from the book. Because you would know if they truly understood it or not. 